Okay, today is going to be a different style Sunday school than you're used to getting from me. Whether that ends up good or bad, you can tell me later. But we are going to uh, kind of do a wrap up in a sense of the study that we just completed on the attributes of God using that fourth discussion question that I showed you who are here last week and ask you to think about a little bit this week, and maybe even look at some passages other than the Luke passage that we'll start with. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, God of gods, Lord of lords, King of kings, you are almighty, and you have wonderful perfect attributes that we've enjoyed studying. Help us to once again come and consider those attributes and how they were manifested in the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, give us a deeper appreciation for you and for that sacrifice and for your attributes and your character as we spend this time today. And we pray that you would use it to help prepare us to celebrating the Lord's Supper today. We pray all these things in the gracious and magnificent name of Jesus. Amen. So, first of all, uh, look at the two, two, the bottom two-thirds of your page. Let's go look at that first and just remind, remind ourselves of what the attributes of God are that we study. Aseity, spirituality, sovereignty, holiness, omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotent, Immutability, truthfulness, wisdom, goodness, grace, love, foreknowledge, and wrath. So those are the things that you want to be thinking about as we slow. Yes, John? I'm glad that you asked. Self-existence. Uh, uh, you're welcome. And... Um, so be looking for those as I slowly read through these passages. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to like read a sentence and then kind of pause. And if any of you see something, one of these attributes, I want you to shout it out. Okay, that's how we're going to do this class today. And let's see how many of these show up in the crucifixion. And as I mentioned last week, the, 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 the Luke... Uh, description of the crucifixion doesn't include everything that happened. And so you may realize, hey, there's some things that are missing here. And remember the passage that has that. You, you may not know these chapter and verse. That's okay. You can shout it out. What about this? And this is the characteristic, the attribute of God that is tied with that. And so we'll see if we can come up and see how many of these and where that we find them. So that is what we're going to do. Starting with uh, Luke chapter 23 and verse 13. Pilate called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us, as you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. Pause, pause. Any, anybody see Goodness. anything? What was that? Goodness. Goodness, yes. Holiness, Holiness. good. Excellent. Uh, with one voice, they cried, away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again and said, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. <coughs> but with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. Okay, good. How about also the foreknowledge of God? 
because God had predicted in advance and prophesied that he would die on a tree. A crucifixion wasn't even in existence when that prophecy was made. You gotta look for these hidden gems. So don't look deep, think deep and broad as we go through this. Okay, anything else? Okay. Um, so Pilate decided to grant their demand. He, he wanted to keep his position. Uh, he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for and surrendered to Jesus to their will. As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way home, away in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it uh, behind him, behind Jesus. A large number of people followed, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Love, yes. Mm -hmm. Truthfulness as well. Yes, foreknowledge and truthfulness. Okay, good. Then they will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Wisdom, I think, is manifested in that. Anything else, or should I continue? Okay. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to a place called the Skull, there they crucified him along the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. What was that? Grace. Grace. Amen. Grace. And love. <coughs> Belinda, please mute your phone. Or your blind. Sorry. No sorry. Worries. No worries. Uh, one more time. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. And um, thinking of that, well, let's let's go on. There's again a couple things not in this passage that are in the other ones. Um, uh, okay. Um, and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Come on. Was that foretold? Yeah. Ah, thank you. So again, foreknowledge, omniscience, sovereignty being manifested. God knew in advance this is how it was going to go down, and it did. So we see these attributes coming through that, you know, if we, we think broadly and deeply, we can see these attributes. I, I, hope, I hope this will help you in your appreciation for uh, God and uh, of the crucifixion. Okay, they divided, they cast the lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself. He is, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. And the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written a, written a notice above him, which uh, read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him saying, don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve but this man has done nothing wrong. Possible. Yes, holiness, what else? Mm -hmm. What else? 
Yes. And we also see his goodness because he had done nothing wrong. And even the criminals recognized that. Pilate recognized that. And yet for expediency to save his job, he gave in. Just as God knew he would. What? I'm sorry, Scott. Ain't that the truth? Yes, exactly. Good. Um, okay. Uh, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Truthfulness, yes. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty. Love, yes, grace and love. Foreknowledge, yes. Yes, there we go. Excellent. Okay, so this is the passage of the crucifixion we looked at. Now, this passage doesn't contain everything. Can you think of some other things that happened during the crucifixion that show us various qualities and attributes of God. Maybe a couple things Jesus said that aren't in this passage. He said uh, to Mary and John, love so Okay. Oh, ah. love, goodness, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Yes, John. Uh, some of the professors at uh, Israel Bible College uh, Institute in, in Jerusalem say that it was traditional during that period of time to pray through Psalm 31 as a uh, in the evening. Into your hand I commit my spirit. Okay, that's the last one. That's the on God. Yes. Good. That's one of the ones I was looking for. And what does that show us in terms of God's attributes? Yep. Okay. And there are a couple other things Jesus said on the cross. Dick. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bing, bing, bing. Okay. My God, my God, why? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So, uh, again, the wrath of God and what he suffered for us with that being poured out and how traumatic that was being separated from his father. Yes, Wendy. Oh, sorry. Tag team. Okay, good. Okay, there's something else he said. Thank you. Yes. And what attributes of God does that show? Justice, yes. And what else? Yes, his wrath. All be because of what was what was offended. Thank you, holiness. Um, in that they planned this before time began, because from the foundation of the world, this plan was set in place. So yes, from that point. 
this, the aseity of God is showing this. Good. Let's move on. Anybody else from any of the <laughs> gospel accounts? Let's move to the wonderful book of Hebrews. Starting with Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11. So I'm going to start at verse 10. Um, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Anything? God is not unjust. He is righteous. He is good. Uh, he is holy. Okay, let's move on. Uh, and starting with verse 13 now, the certainty of God's promises. When God made this promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Yes. Mm -hmm. And grace anything that he promised is pure grace because we don't deserve anything other than wrath. Uh, he certainly is that. No one greater for no one greater for him to swear by. Yes, omnipotent. Um, men swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all, all arguments because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of this hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. Yes, good. The city. Uh huh. What else? Truthfulness. Truthfulness, yes. Can't lie. Yep. Because whenever he makes a promise, it is certain, absolutely certain, to come true. We are yes and amen in Christ, as it's said elsewhere. Good. Uh, God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to, to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged, which when you think of encouragement, you think of his love and his goodness uh, and his grace. And of course, the fact that he made a promise requires foreknowledge that he was going to bring it about too. So that's in there too. Um, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. So think, you can think of uh, passages like when Paul was out there on the sea and they were trying to drop the anchors to keep the boat from moving and it, it was, it didn't work out. But in this case, we have an anchor that is so big, so strong that it is immovable. That promise is absolutely solid and secure. Yes, absolutely. Um, it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Yes. Very good. Thank you. And when you think of a high priest, you think of holiness as well. But you also think of 
representative because of wrath and of therefore of uh, his holiness, etc. cetera. Yes, it's immutability, thank you. Okay, now let's move to the next chapter. Verse, uh, chapter seven, starting at verse 21. I'm starting with verse 11, start, excuse me. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the law was given to the people, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. He of whom these things are, are said belong to a different tribe and not and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Mel Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. What else? Yes, I saw a hand in the back. Oh, maybe I didn't. Okay. What else? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The form of regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. Which, you know, that verse in and of itself, anyone who thinks works righteousness and salvation by their works, um, this just knocks that flat. Um, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Grace, yes. Think about that. Draw near to God. Draw into the very presence of God. That's love. That's grace. That's goodness to people who did not deserve goodness. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests. Uh, without any oath, but he became a, a priest with an oath when God said, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Yes. Immutability will not change his mind. Again, God determined all these things before the foundation of the world. He set this all in motion before the foundation of the world. And it's all playing out under his omnipotent, sovereign oversight and will come to a complete completion. The first Kairos was when Jesus was born and then uh, died and rose. And the second Kairos is when he returns, all in God's plan. He knew the dates, which he doesn't reveal to us, from the foundation of the world. Sovereign, omnipotent, omniscient, immutable, gracious. Um, continuing in verse 23. Now, there have been many of those priests since Death prevented them from continuing in office, but Jesus lives forever. He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Nothing? Really? It's Nothing? materiality, which would, if he not only lives, but immutability probably. Yeah, and his eternality is tied in with his aseity. That's true, too. Yeah. That's true. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> Grace, I mean, he ever lives to intercede for us, mm -hmm. his, his grace, his love for us. And of course, all of this shows God's foreknowledge. Because of the interconnectedness of all of the attributes, every single one of the attributes is found to some extent in every single event of scripture. Hey, you paid attention to the foundations of this class. Excellent. Yes. They're all interconnected. They're all inseparable. So they're all present to some extent throughout everything. We just have to look for them and see it. And then we appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to use an analogy or bring back an analogy that he used. Uh, that, that diamond for the engagement ring for his wife. You know. He looked at it, went, this is okay. And then the jeweler put it on that black velvet. And the lights just burst forth, seeing all these, all this flame of color. That's what we are to see in the scriptures. It, it's supposed to beam out to us and just overwhelm us with its brilliance, its beauty. The beauty of God should come through the scriptures as we see his characters characteristics, his attributes manifested for our benefit, for our good. Uh, let's see, where did we, and then finishing off that section, such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for himself, for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people, he sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. So the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever. Um, what, what did you say, John? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Yes, immutability, perfect forever. So holiness, perfection, and uh, unchangeableness, yes. And this all manifests the wisdom of God, because as was said earlier, we would never co have come up with this plan. This is counterintuitive to us. It is counterintuitive to Jesus' own disciples. They were just bewildered, befuddled, baffled at this. But then later, they finally got it. Like us, they, they were, they could need to be hit with a two by four from time to time. Um, good. Let's move on to chapter nine. Short passage, 11 to 15, the blood of Christ. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by a means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. I'll stop there. More. Holiness. Yes. It's a seity again, the eternal redemption. Uh, we can, because he's eternal, he can give us eternal life. Okay. Verse 13, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God.
Nothing? Yes. And, and yes, Grace. Yes. Yeah. That when you when you combine combine, uh, if you will, um, omnipresence, uh, omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotence, sovereignty. Um, you uh, and his aseity, you have the idea of yeah. his e eternal nature, his infinite nature, and, which is a spiritual nature. Spirituality is throughout this, but it's always kind of, if you will, more implicit than, than uh, explicit most of the time. Okay. Uh, so moving on. Wait a minute, did I finish that? Oh, no, I didn't. Um, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of, oh, I did, didn't I? Yes, that we may serve the living God. That's our privilege. That is the only proper response to what God has done for us, is to serve him. So I, I would just remind you of the great doxology in Romans chapter 11, after Paul has gone through all the, that great doctrine about God and salvation. He breaks into that incredible doxology and then immediately into what is our spiritual service of worship that should be offered daily to prove his will, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. That is what is fit for us to, that's what is fit in terms of our response to all of this is to serve the living God with all that's within us. Okay, uh, turning to chapter 10. Start just verse 1, then we'll go to 5 to 14. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it could never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. It all foreshadowed what was going to come. Like the, out of God's foreknowledge of what Christ would do, those things were put in place to point us forward to Christ, to help us to appreciate even more that once for all sacrifice that replaced, you know, what theoretically would have been hundreds of thousands of sacrifices, millions maybe, of sacrifices made day after day. Uh, the once for all and how how magnificent it was because it was the infinite eternal son of God who gave himself for us. Okay, moving to verse five. Where is it? There. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. Stopping there. Yes. This was prophesied too. So foreknowledge, omniscience. He brought it about so omnipotence was there. His sovereignty. His holiness manifested by... You know, we can't be holy, and these other sacrifices that were made is a type and shadow to cleanse outwardly, even as one of the previous passages said, but could not give us the real cleansing we needed. Only Christ could do that. It all pointed forward to him, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect lamb of God. Verse 8. Uh, first, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although they required law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first set of laws to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which he can never take away sins. But such an important word in the scriptures. 
when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Quick note, there were no chairs in their tabernacle or the temple. They never sat down. They were always standing because their work was never finished. Again, what did Christ say? It is finished. And he could sit down. Uh, since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Uh, so, uh, yeah, stop there. All right. Grace? Obviously, holiness. What else? And his goodness to us. He's making us holy. We who are unholy, we who are rebellious, we who were his enemies, he is making holy. He is making perfect, like our elder brother Jesus Christ, with whom we are co heirs, co inheritors. Mike, I think we have to remember that except for six attributes, every single one of the other attributes appear in man. He lost three of them at creation, according to Colossians 3.10 and, and the, uh, Ephesians 4.24, we lost our true knowledge, our holiness, and our righteousness has been restored in Christ. Hallelujah! <laughs> we, and we have it in part, we have it positionally, we just don't know it in full yet until he comes or we're in his presence through passing into glory. Okay, let's turn to the final passage in chapter 13 of Hebrews. That great benediction. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And again, the covenant of redemption is very clear. Yes. Equip you with every good for doing his will. Wisdom is shown in that. Goodness and grace and love to help us to do that because only, only as we work, as he works in us to do what's pleasing to him, only when that happens or as that happens more and more, we try to find the most peace and joy and fulfillment. If we are fighting him on those as he tries to work in us, if we reject his counsel, as we saw in the Old Testament, did, did they enjoy their lives? Or did they enjoy the blessings or the cursings? Sometimes it was the blessings, but when they turned away, when they stopped listening, when they stopped obeying, it was a curse. Right? He wants to work in us what is pleasing to him, what glorifies him, but that is what benefits us the most. It is what is in our best interest. Um, and his, we d really didn't mention his omnipresence. I don't think I ever heard that mentioned, but it's again throughout this without his omnipresence how could he exercise his sovereign will without his omnipre uh, omnipresence how could he be omniscient etc so it's there too even though we didn't really mention it any final comments or questions
Yes, Brett. Yes. Uh, every time we looked at sacrifice, wrath was involved. And it wasn't mentioned every time, but it was mentioned sporadically. But again, again, going back to that analogy that he used of, you know, we only understand the goodness of what God has to offer in light of the blackness of the wrath of God, the, the blackness of our sin that deserves only wrath. It's only when we have that understanding, and you know, we're supposed to incrementally grow in that understanding, then we grow it in our appreciation for the greatness of Christ's sacrifice, the greatness of God's love for you and me, and the greatness of what we have to look forward to. Every time you see blood pictures in the scriptures, that's wrath. Exactly. The life of the flesh is in the blood I've given for you upon the altar of sacrifice. And those offerings were daily, morning and evening. Lots of blood, lots of animals. And we look at those celebrate those. We, we, we've looked at times at some of those big celebrations where seemingly hundred, hundreds of thousands of animals were slaughtered as sacrifices. That's a whole lot of blood. They estimate that on, on Passover, on one half million animals sacrificed. Yeah. We can't even begin to picture that. No, we can't. And it did really nothing except point forward to this sacrifice. Because it could not heal. It could not bring forgiveness. Only Christ could. Let's pray. Oh, gracious, majestic Lord, we come before you. You are holy. You are righteous. And so much more. We thank you for the time we've been able to spend today and throughout this uh, series and segments uh, looking at your incredible attributes that are, as we've said, absolutely interconnected and inseparable. So when one is present, they're really all present. We thank you that in your grace and in your mercy, you have chosen to make us your children, your sons and your daughters that you have taken us rebellious children, ungrateful children, and you have made us co-heirs with Christ. What a high calling. Help us desire to live lives that please you, that, are, uh, that correspond to the highness of the calling. Again, we are ambassadors to the world of the King of Kings. And we are to make your message known clearly and effectively through our words and through our actions. May you equip us more and more, yet more to do that which is pleasing to you, that which is, fulfills your will. Help us to be faithful and fruitful in our service to you. And help us now to worship you with great appreciation and gratitude in spirit and in truth. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, we'll start a series from Tim Hogue that will be by video, which I think I now have finally received the link to, uh, but I haven't actually seen it yet. So um, I uh, hope to prepare it and be ready next week. Uh, that'll be for three weeks. And then the last Sunday of this month, we'll have the pleasure of hearing John, John and Lori's son, Steve, talk about the influence of the Reformation on education. That should be very interesting. You're dismissed. Sorry, I went a couple minutes over. You take care. I'm going to stop the recording.